Let's open our syllabus to the first page. We'll, we'll begin our lecture now. Begin our lecture talking about the qualifications for biblical leadership. We'll spend the bulk, we'll spend the bulk of our discussion on uh, the qualifications for biblical lit- leadership and then talk about some essentials of leading and then finish the class with some essentials on discipleship and impacting others. So we'll spend, uh, we'll begin by talking about the qualifications for biblical leadership. And our first, uh, first item on the agenda here is just talking about the leader's calling, the leader's calling. Um, in a sense, when we think of calling, there'll be two directions we'll be going. There'll be a a sense where there is a a kind of an experiential calling where you sense God uh, personally calling you into the ministry and giving you that sense of the call. Uh, And there are some, there's some that that feel this way. And then there is another sense of the calling where it's not so much a personal calling as it is a calling to a vocation. There is a vocation, there is an office of ministry, of church ministry or pastor, etc. And therefore, um, it's a calling from that, from that perspective. So there's not this personal spiritual dimension to it, but a sense of God having this office available and then you and I filling that office. All right, so as we walk through this, uh, you can uh, more or less um, look at what is there and then we'll have some some observations made toward the end of this lecture in relation to that. First of all, when we talk about the the calling, uh, we want to talk, first of all, about the nature of the office. Nature of the office. Uh, Let me just preface this by saying that that sometimes when we we come to seminary, we say, well, God, I'm here because God has called me to preach the word. God has called me to be a preacher. Um... Well, God called me here to study the Word so I can preach the Word. As we walk through this class and also the class on preaching, we will eventually find out that it's not necessarily a call to preach, you know, as it is a call to the office, to the office that God has called us to. Preaching is one dimension of the office. Okay? Preaching is just one way that we are able to complete or fulfill the purposes for which God has called us. And so we'll, we'll talk about that and you'll wrestle with that as you move along in your seminary career. So it isn't just preaching, but it's more than just preaching. As we study the nature of the office, you begin to see that. The um, office is really called a threefold office, threefold office, where three terms are used to describe the office. Episcopos, presbyteros, and then poimenos. That is the office of, that, that includes the overseer, uh, the, uh, the office of elder and the office of pastor, which are really one and the same. When we talk about the, the overseer or the bishop, or we talk about the uh, elder or the presbyter, or we talk about the shepherd or the pastor, it's really one and the same person. But it's good for us to see the different name because it helps us to understand the nature of this office. I've given you a whole list of references there. We won't turn to all of them today, but they're there for your... Um, for your uh, information to get you to know what they are. But let's examine this idea of, um, of overseer, elder, and, and pastor. It's good for you to know what it's about before you get into it. Um, when I got into the ministry, I had a clue what was going on. Uh, I mean, I went to a good seminary, but somehow PM wasn't, a, wasn't their, their, their forte. So when I launched in the ministry, it's, you ask, you know, what in the world did I get myself into was my, my, my first reactions. When I, all of a sudden I realized that it was more than just spending 40 hours a week in the text and then preparing Bible studies. It was much more than that. A list of uh, issues that we had to deal with. And I thought to myself, what in the world did I get myself into? So I want you to know what you're getting yourself into. Okay? The idea of episkopos, the idea of overseer, is the fact that this is, this is describing an office. This is describing an office that God has established in his church. The idea of overseer, overseer means to, to, to basically observe, to examine, to visit, to care for. If there's a word, if there's a word that we want to put here is, a, is a, a accountability or 
responsibility. The responsibility for the church needs to rest on the shoulders of somebody. And so the answer is, upon whom? Upon the overseer. Upon the overseer. So it rests upon the overseer. So it's an office. And in a sense, this, this office comes with both a job description and secondly, it comes also with a, a description of the qualifications of the person that fills the office. First Timothy 3, 1 and following, if any man desires the office of, aspires to the office of overseer, it is the fine work he desires to do, episkopos. And then he talks about qualifications for the overseer. So it's, it's an office. So it's the idea, here's the office called episkopos. You and I here, training for ministry, we're training... To, to fulfill this office. Um, you might call it, and I hope you don't get offended by this, it's basically it's, it's a CEO. It's a spiritual CEO of the ecclesia. Now, we're talking about plurality of leadership, okay? So it's not just one CEO, but a group of men who are called elders who are going to fill this office of overseers, and it's their job to be responsible for all the flock. You know, all the, there's no such thing as a, as a man who says, my job is just to preach. You know, I just preach, I just study, I don't worry about administration, I don't worry about, then friend, then you are not an episcopus. Okay, you're not an episcopus, you might be a teacher, but you're not a pastor, you're not an elder, you're not a bishop, you're not an overseer. You're simply a teacher, and that's different than being a pastor. And we do need teachers. But sometimes the teacher gets into the position of elder, and then all of a sudden, there's nobody accountable for the work. Nobody overseeing the particular ministry. I want you to see that because it's important as you understand what you're studying for and what God is going to call you to do. Notice number two, we have the word elder. The word elder. And in this particular term, we're looking at basically qualifications. Qualifications. Presbuteros. This term has a lot to do in respect to age or the maturity of the person. If you compare Titus 1, 5 and following, the descriptions in Titus 1, 5 have to do with elders. I left you in Crete, I left you in Crete to, to appoint elders in every church. And then it begins to list the qualifications of elder. You put Timothy, Timothy 3 and Titus 1 side by side, and you realize they're talking about the very same person. The bishop, the episcopos, and the, and the elder, presbyteros, are the same person. Same office. But the emphasis with elder is on qualifications. Maturity, age. And so the idea here is, this fellow has experience, experience with God and experience with life. Okay, he has experience with God and experience with life. That's why in Timothy, uh, he reminds us that this fellow should not be a neophytus. Remember that? Don't let him be a novice or neophytus, which is a, a newly planted twig or tree, a little tender shoot. A little sapling that just came off out of the ground. He says, you can't have an elder be a guy who doesn't have experience underneath his belt. Okay. Now as we look around the class this afternoon, what do we see? What do we see? We have saplings. Okay. An occasional gray-haired dude here. So we have a Every now and then, a guy or bald, balding guy, which means you've been around the block a few times. But for the most part, we have saplings. We've got a problem, don't we? Because in three or four years, we're going we're gonna, to, or two years, three years, we're going to shove you out and put you in the position of, of overseer. America does that. The American church does that. And uh, it can be fatal to us. Fatal to us as ministers, fatal to the church because you're putting these guys out there. They tell us that in World War II, the Germans took such a beating during the Second World War that by the end of the war, they, they had captains of submarines that were like 16 years old. They're running submarines at the age of 16 because they had no one, no one else left. 
The kids were running the show. Well, you know, with that, you're not going to last very long if you're doing that. Uh, so what, how do we solve the issue? And how do we solve the problem of being niafutas? Uh, fellows, let me suggest get old fast. <laughs> okay? Get old fast. And how do you get old fast? How do you get old fast? Experience. Experience. Get old fast by getting experience. How do you get experience? What's that? Do it. Get experience by doing it. Get out there and get your feet wet. Do things. Everything that you think a minister should do, go try it. Fellows, we, um, we can make a major mistake in seminaries. This can become a, um, this can become a, a monastery for us. We can, we can spend uh, three or four years in this monastery, i.e., uh, away, from, away from the world, away from involvement, and they get actually no experience, and then we're still in the afutas when we get out. We have no experience. Uh, get yourself and get out and do things. You know, get out and, and do things. Uh, get involved in as many things as possible. Get experience. Some of you fellows are, are married, uh, recently married. It's great stuff. Great stuff because you're going to be experienced at least with wifey, with your wifey on how to be a husband, and with kids, right? It's, it's easy to pontificate when you're a single guy, right? No wife, no kids, you're 25, 26 years old. It's easy to pontificate on, on Ephesians chapter 6. But once the wife comes in and the kids come in, it's amazing how your big jack-in-the-box head, you know, really gets <laughs> nice and small. When you realize your wife's sitting in the front pew and you're talking about husbands love your wives and she's looking at you saying, aha, you know, and calling you out. Park it there, preacher. Let's hear you. See, in other words, so, so the idea is to get experience. Make yourself, get yourself out. We have, a, we have an ugly city. It, uh, L.A. Is a, is a beautiful city. It's also a very ugly city. You know, get out there. If you're in the suburbs, leave it. Get out, in the, get out here. You know, go out cruising the boulevard some night. Get out there, walk the streets. Meet some winos. Meet some gangbangers. You know, meet some, go out in the street. You know, meet some prostitutes. Meet some, meet some homosexuals. Talk to them. You know, get the experience out there. You know, know, what's, know what it's like. Man, you know what's... You know, preach at the prison, preach in the jail. Get out there where they lock the doors behind you. And you're there having to preach to guys that, you know, and get these kinds of experiences. Get out there and meet with people. That way you can be young and be old at the same time. Versus being young and then just really being young. We've had some guys, and I, that's why I gave you the, uh, the exhortation to move out of, you know, kids, little children's ministries into adult ministries. Because we have some guys that just insist on being in in, 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 in first grade for four years. And then they, then they want to go from first grade to being senior pastor. You know, it's major, major, major difference. To go from doing that, you need to get out, begin to do these kinds of things. Sir. Well, the blessing, the discharge of what Scripture qualifies an elder to be, and as you point out, the back of most of us are young. The blessing of having the make the best of a bad situation and just sort of try to grow up as quickly as possible when we be, just have to start acknowledging that perhaps some of us need to wait longer before we pursue the office of elder. I mean, I mean I'm considering myself not being, just because I got a degree from here being qualified, until I really can develop my own home and really feel like I could open that up and be an example of others. I, I mean, what do we do? Do we just make the best of a bad scenario or do we hold off pursuing the office of elder? Now, the ideal scenario, the ideal is to find an internship. That's the ideal, to graduate from seminary, go someplace, be an internship, and then put some hair on your chest. You know, get, get old a little bit, get some gray hair, get some experience, get some, you know, get some bruises, you might say. That's the ideal. Again, our churches are not designed to do that. So, that's, that's, so the next best thing is for us to get experience now. Because most of us won't have the financial luxury to do that, to go out there and just kind of wait four or five years, get a secular job. Uh, you don't need to do that. You don't need to do that. The church, the church is patient with us when we're young. They understand 
understand this concept. Okay, they understand this concept. And the American church is like that. Um, other, some of our ethnic churches are not like that. Our Hispanic churches are not like that. Um, because they respect age. Some of the Asian churches are not like that. They, they respect age. So if you're like 60, a man of 60 with no seminary degree is worth you know, 10 times a man of 25 with a PhD in theology. So he, he just, because that's age comes in. So the American culture is kind to neophytes. Okay. But the American church is not always you know, kind in, in treating them. So that's why it's good for us to get as much experience as possible. And so you can. You can get old, okay, even though you're young. If you just allow yourself to get out there and get some experience. Force yourself out there. See, the natural tendency is to be reclusive. Yes, that's a natural tendency, just not to get out there. It's like the old tortoise stick our heads in the shell and just kind of hide and, you know, hang in there till we graduate. But then uh, you don't want to do that. So internships is the best. May I say, because of that, because of that, as you graduate and start your churches, make provisions for interns in your churches, knowing that we have this problem, where you can actually bring a guy on board, and he can be in your church and be maturing there, and, and he can be growing, you can be helping the guy. And I had, I had that privilege when I was in seminary. I, had this, I was a, a, an associate pastor, and boy, it really helped me a lot. Man, it was fantastic to be under this guy's ministry because I'd get some doozies. And I was out door to door. I was going door to door evangelism, counseling people. And they come to me with doozies. Like, Alex, you know, I have this divorce. I have this problem with my wife. And, you know, she wants to divorce me. Help me. What do I do? And I would say, you know what? You need to talk to the pastor about that one. <laughs> go see, you know. I would say, go see. Because, you know, this thing was really hot. But when you're the guy. And they come to you and you sit there and you're saying, do you <laughs> and inside you're saying, God, help me. Lord, do something right now. And you're, and you're going through your pages of your PM manual and there was no discussion on that, you know. <laughs> you, you're in for some doozies, you know. So again, um, so the idea of elder is the idea of then uh, getting old. So get some experience. And then number three, the idea of pastor. This is our job description our job description. The idea of a shepherd talks about, so he has the analogy of a shepherd and sheep, right? A pastor and his flock. And so the Lord helps us by giving us that picture of ministry. Or the shepherd is an illustration of the spiritual care of God's people, and God's people are the flock. And so the great analogies are made between the shepherd and the pastor, uh, the church of God, and the flock. And we do that. And so it really helps us to identify, you know, our job description, what God has called us to do. I've given you a, a, a B, and C there. Uh, let's revise it a little bit under, under A. That's before B. Put uh, the actual work is, is, is B, uh, is A, to lead the flock. To lead the flock. We'll, we'll start with that. To lead the flock. Uh, put Hebrews 13, 7. And... Uh, Hebrews 13, 17, and 1 Thessalonians 5, 12. Along with that, add 1 Peter 5, 2. 1 Peter 5, 2. Uh, God has called us to lead. And so you are the basic leader, uh, leader in, uh, in, the, uh, in, in the church, and you're going to lead by your character. You're going to lead by who you are primarily. We'll also learn principles of leadership, okay? But you are the leader. You provide, uh, you provide direction, vision. Uh, you provide modeling, example, etc. But you're the leader. Number two, number two, uh, we're called to feed, to feed the flock. John 21, 16, Acts 20, 28, 1 Peter 5, 2. And 1 Thessalonians 5.12. The whole idea here is nurture, nurture. That the, um, that the health, this is this, talking about the health of the flock. The health of the flock. The, the shepherds exist to produce a healthy flock. That's the purpose of it. 
So if after 10 years of ministry, uh, your flock is still dysfunctional, still messed up and still unhealthy, <laughs> whose fault is it? Yeah, it's, our, it's, it's our fault. It's our fault. I say that because this is, again, this is up to you. You have to be, be able to take the flock, and you may take a flock that is going to be a little bit sick or much, has much illness to it, but your job is to take this flock and to feed it, to nourish it, to nourish it, and to produce then a, a healthy flock. And we'll talk more about that under, in 7.12. You know, what, it, what is a healthy, a, healthy, a healthy flock? Ultimately, just to help us a little bit, ultimately a healthy flock is where the love of God is being displayed towards one another. That's the ultimate description of health. It's where the, sh the flock loves one another. It is not measured by knowledge. It is not measured by knowledge. Maturity is never measured by knowledge. Maturity is always, always measured by the love of God pouring out from our lives into the lives of others. Okay, understand that. And that's going to be the ultimate, ultimate display, you know, of if your flock is healthy. Number three, your job is also to protect the flock. Protect the flock. We see that in Acts 20:28. 20, Acts 20:28, 20, where the Apostle Paul writes to the Ephesian elders, right? Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock of God. He says, after my departure, savage wolves will come, not sparing the flock. And so the flock um, has enemies, and your job is to protect the flock. So you're a guardian, a guardian, you're there to protect the flock. By the way, protect the flock from wolves from the outside, those that are trying to destroy the, fl the flock from without, and then also protect the flock from within, because sometimes the worst enemies of the flock are the sheep themselves. Sheep do bite. And they end up biting each other half the time. Okay, and so part of our job is to make sure that the sheep are not self-destructing. So it's a 24-hour issue. 24-hour issue. We, are, we have a, a young pastor in our church. He's, this is his second year. We're, we're in a church planting, so this is one of our church plants, and it's the second year, and he, it's finally dawning on him. He said to me the other day, last Friday, he says, uh, uh, is there ever a time where we have no problems? You see, it seems like there's always a problem going on. Is there, is there ever a time when we have no problems? I said, uh, good morning, I says. You finally, no, there never is. There never is a day when there are no problems. There's always some little fire, something going on someplace, somewhere. It's just the nature of, the nature of the animal. Okay, the nature of the beast is that there's always something going on. Uh, some attack from without some issue from within, always something going on. And so that's why it's always a kind of a, a constant vigilance, a constant oversight in relation to this. But it's your job, your job. And so this is why a pastor is going to be zealous for his flock. And by zealous, I also mean jealous for, for your flock. There's a sense of jealousy that comes in relation to that. Uh, you're going to be passionate about, about ministry, about your sheep. Because this is part of, your, part of your nature, to be always on the lookout for these things. And then, under D as well, the pastor's job, shepherd's job is to equip, equip the flock. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, right? He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. So, in essence, you're a spiritual coach, spiritual coach, Equipping the flock for reproduction. For reproduction, equipping the flock also for ministry towards one another. So that becomes, again, your, your task, uh, your job description. So this is uh, something that we are, we are called to do. So now let's back it up. So see, it's more than just preaching the word. Remember that? Well, God called me to preach the word. Wrong, wrong. If you're going to put on the cloak of an episkopos, praise Buteros, of a shepherd, boy, do we have news for you. Your job in the study is just one facet. See, it's just one part of your ministry. Maybe a very important part, 
but it's only one part of your overall ministry. You've got to be involved in a lot of other things that come with the territory. So it's good for us to know that because then it realize that this, these are humongous shoes for us to fill, but these are the people that God has put in charge of his church. So number one then, consider the nature of the office. First of all, the threefold nature of the office. He's, a, he's an overseer, he's an elder, and he's also a pastor. Notice I had B, I had A, now put B underneath that, it's not in your notes, under the three words that point to one under that, put B, the divine nature of the office, the divine nature of the office, but B, the divine nature of the office. If you'll remember Acts 20, Acts 20, 28. where the Apostle Paul speaking to the elders. Um, you find, by the way, also in, um, in Acts 20, the, the, the three terms used interchangeably for the same, the same man. Acts 20, 28, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock of God, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he, which he purchased with his own blood. Um, as you look at that text carefully, and by the way, Mr. Richard Baxter will, that's his, that's his exposition of the book. He'll take that verse and just expound on it for like 10 zillion pages, okay? And, um, but it's, it's really a re rather strong exhortation. Uh, reminding us, first of all, that, that the church is the Lord's, okay? The church is the Lord's. It's the flock of God, First Peter 5 Okay, 5, 2. It's the flock of God. It's the church that he purchased with his own, what? His own blood. Now, fellows, fellows, look at that very carefully because the church is the Lord's. Okay. And let me just remind us. It isn't just, it isn't just first fundamental, it's the Lord's. It isn't just uh, grace community, it's the Lord's. It's also First Baptist Church. Okay, it's also First Southern Baptist Church down the street. It's First EV Free Church down the street. Okay, it could be the First Assembly of God Church down the street. Okay, this is, that's God's church. We get the impression sometimes that we have the right to go around knocking His church. Hmm? That just because they don't, they don't agree with us and with every, every theological jot and tittle, that we have the right to just lambast and criticize and sometimes even destroy the church. Recognize that it's not your church, it is whose church? God's church. I'm not saying we should not be discerning. Okay, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that every church that calls themselves a Christian church is God's church. There's some that are apostate. Apostate. But there are many churches that you and I would label as not perfect churches with a lot of problems, a lot of, lots of difficulties, right? It would be almost on the verge of crossing the line and, uh, you know, sometimes even destroying it. I had a discussion with a fellow years ago who uh, was a young neophyte, neophyte kind of a guy, and he got, uh, got kind of cocky because he could preach a good sermon every now and then, and people thought he could preach, and they thought that he should be the pastor of the church. Because they do that sometimes, they'll They'll butter you up and say, man, you're a great pastor. You should be the pastor of the church here, not brother so-and-so. So I went to his head. And he called me to, he wanted to arrange a, a meeting and split the church and, and, and boot the guy out, you know, et cetera. And I said, you know, I said, you better watch what you're doing because, you see, unless you have a mandate from God, unless you got a word like Moses got on Mount Sinai, unless you got a word like John the Baptist got, unless you, unless you were on the Mount of Transfiguration and God spoke to you along with Moses and Elijah, you had better be careful to be messing with God's church. He'll take your carcass and thrash it. So don't mess with it. It may not be a perfect church the way you want it to be, but unless you got a mandate from God, you just better mind your own business because this church is God's church. Does that make sense to us? Well, I'm glad he took advice because you know what? Uh, you don't want to do that. And we have, and it's sad to say, we have sometimes folks from seminary get out of here, go out there and take a church and thrash it, destroy it, 
and then think they're doing God a favor because they just ruined somebody's church. You know, friends, any fool can destroy a church. Look, as long as, look how long as it's taking for us to put those fountains out in the front. <laughs> how long has it been? You know, I thought it would be like two days' work. It only took two days to wipe the baby out. True? I mean, in one, one day they came in and they blew the whole thing out. And look how long it's taking. What I'm saying to you is any fool can destroy. It takes a long time to build. And you're going to find that out when you go out to start ministry. It takes a long time to build, a, to build even a, a church of any type, let alone to build a great church. So what I'm saying here with, with this word is because of the divine, divine nature of, of the church, it belongs to him and always recognize that. So when you take the position of a church, it's his. It's his, not yours. And you're there to do his bidding, not your bidding. Okay, and, and so and number two, number two, recognize that the charge is from the Holy Spirit, among whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseer. So it is he will be the one that will prompt you to take on that responsibility. Here again will be the sense of the call. He will call you to a ministry, okay, and that will be the ministry God calls you to. Uh, or it will be a sense where you will know that this is where God wants you to be. The Holy Spirit will, will, will move in such a way as you will know that this is where he wants you to be. In either case, he's the one that placed you there. He's the one that placed you there, and so we want to recognize that. And that's why Paul said to the elders, listen, God has placed you here. God has you here. And when God places you in the ministry, uh, you need to recognize that. When God has you there, that allows you also to have great perseverance and great endurance when it comes to ministry. To know that God has placed you there and you can't, you can't just leave. And secondly, you can't have guys just, you know, throw you out because they don't like you. I told our people First Fundamental when we had our, our first... Uh, one of our first splits, we had a number of splits, you know. You learn a lot, you know, you learn by trial and error. Um, some of these are my fault. We'll talk about those, you know, as time goes on. Others of them were not my fault. They just happen. You know, people just get in. When it's a small church, wolves come in and try to destroy this issue. And I told the folks, you know, I used Nikita Khrushchev's uh, famous saying, I will bury you. Remember that one? And I told him, I'll bury you because I'm young. I'm only 26 years old. Some of you guys are 50. I'm going to outlive you guys. I'm here to stay. God brought me here, and you can't chase me out of here because I'm here to stay. It's only when you know that God has put you there that you can make that kind of statement. You ain't going nowhere. I'm here. God placed me here until he pulls my number and tells me to go someplace else. I'm here to stay. So forget about trying to run me out of town. It's not going to happen. And see, in that... That kind of confidence comes when you recognize that God's Spirit has placed you in this position of ministry. God brought you to seminary, did He not? Okay, then God is going to also move in that direction and place you in the ministry that He wants you to be in. And once you're there, that's where it's going to be. Then number three under that, the divine nature of the office. Number one, the church is the Lord's. Number two, the church is from the Holy Spirit. Number three, our accounting is to the Lord. Our accounting is to the Lord. Hebrews 13, 17, Hebrews 13, 17, and 1 Peter 5, verses 4 and 5. 1 Peter 5, verses 4 and 5. We have to give an account to God for this ministry. So God says to the, to the elders and leaders in Hebrews, they have to give an account to God for you. And so when we realize that, that we have to give an account for the ministry God has called us to perform, uh, it does something to you. We don't enter into this task. Listen, it's not just because you need a job, you're going to take a church, okay? It's because God is placing you there and you have to give an account to God. That means that under this, we need to, first of all, take our work seriously and conscientiously. Take your work seriously and conscientiously. You know, I thank the Lord for the caliber of men we have in our seminary because you take your work seriously and conscientiously. It's a, it's a prelude, a precursor of what's going to happen out there. Listen, you're sloppy here, you'll be sloppy there. Okay? If you're sloppy here, you'll be sloppy there. 
if your conscience is here, you'll be there as well. He that is faithful in little things, okay, will be faithful also in much. And this is why as we go through this process now of being involved in whatever we're doing, it's because we realize we have to give an account, account to God. Number two, it also means that we need to do our work joyously and willingly. We have to give an account to God, which means that now we put our heart into that, we give it our all, and we do that with joy, with joy. And uh, if anything, uh, among many things I want, to, I want to communicate to you this semester is just the joy of ministry. You know, the joy of ministry. We've been in ministry now, I think, 30, 35 years, 35 years, and it's just as exciting today as it was way back then, if not more exciting. This is, uh, it's just great. My, my son asked me one day, he says, Daddy, he says, Dad, don't you ever get bored? I said, no, son, I'm never bored. Never am I bored. It's always like I'm right on the edge of excitement. It's like, it's like riding a wave, you know what I'm saying? It's like there's always like something happening. And it's just joyous to be involved in ministry. Are there down times? Oh, yeah. Are there heartaches? Absolutely. But man, just to know that, that I need to serve God with, uh, with, my, with, uh, with a heart that is full of joy. And then number three under that, do your work faithfully. Faithfully. You have to give an account to God. So just be faithful. You don't just answer to people. You answer to whom? You answer to God. And that's why it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, it is required of stewards that a man be found what? Found faithful or trustworthy. Uh, the issue is uh, do the job God has called you to do. You know, finish the task. Do the job God has called you to do. Finish the task. Learn to be faithful. You know, you, uh, you can be bright you can be bright, you can be intelligent, you can be charismatically gifted, or you're a great speaker, and have, but you know what? If you're not faithful, you're letting the Lord down and you're letting us down. True? So it's the whole idea of just being faithful, of just showing up. And, and the key ingredient to ministry is going to be that. Just, you know, doing it, you know, week after week, year after year decade after decade, and just coming through with whatever God has called you, to, knowing that you have to give an account to God for everything that you do. Why? Because we have to answer to Him. We stop answering to people. You know, you don't answer to me, you don't answer to anybody else, you're going to answer to God ultimately. And so we start now by recognizing that. So it's good for us to know then the nature of this office. So, yeah, so I mentioned now, see, what, 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 what I've just pictured to you? So it's more than just sitting down and taking a text and exegesis, get up and preaching a uh, sermon with three points and three poems and, and you holler a little bit and then you close and go home and get paid, you know, 100,000 bucks for that. It's more than that. I'm just joking. You ain't going to get paid jack for that. <laughs> it's just, but realizing, realizing that this is what God has called you to do, these huge shoes. Now we're going to work at filling those shoes by preparing ourselves for this ministry. Amen? Well, our time is up. We'll stop right there.